The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. In the year 2000, Ben Heckendorn built his first mod. We can rebuild it smaller, better, portable. Since then, he has continued his work, helping those in need with creative new projects. If you've got an idea you'd like to see built, why not send it to The Ben Heck Show? Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. In today's episode, we're going to be revisiting a project from the past. Back in the spring of 2011, I attempted to build a portable 3D printer. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, we only got it working well enough to print a small hexagon on the show. However, later that year, I found the time to tweak and finish the printer, and it's been working quite well ever since. In May of 2012, I decided to build a better version of the portable printer that I could take to Maker Faire, and that is what we're going to cover on this episode. Let's see what happens. So here's the 3D printer that we built last spring. Um, it's actually working quite well now, so I'll t take you through uh, some of its basic features and some of the things that I um, improved upon it since that last episode. All right, this is the bird extruder. It's a replacement for the uh, Maker Gear extruder that we originally used. And this allows you to quickly open it up and change the filament instead of having to like unscrew the four bolts. So that's where it's pretty nice. Down here, this is a little different. This is the um, heated bed platform. This is basically a PCB that is sold on uh, 3D printing websites. And it's got a copper, solid copper on top, but underneath there's a whole bunch of traces, kind of like your oven. And this is a heated bed platform, which does two things. A, the nozzle can't burn through it like it would with plastic. And B, it's hot, so your first layer of print sticks to it quite well, which helps you um, with your printing accuracy. And that's about it for the new features. So this was supposed to be a briefcase printer back when we made it, but we didn't have enough time to complete it, so I just bolted this on solid. The idea was it was going to have two sides on, on th like this, and then we were going to fold up to enclose it. And then the y-axis was going to be part of the side. So after you unfolded it, the y-axis went into position. But again, we didn't have time to do it, so we just made this solid platform, which works. But this thing is only as portable as it appears now. It's always going to be open frame. It moves around pretty good. Um, we have these bearings on the rods, which gives it actually a nice smooth motion, although it takes up quite a bit of space, which we're going to have to optimize for our new printer. But I've printed quite a few things with it. Here's a bracket for something. Here's a spam lid. So this one worked out pretty good, but not really portable as I wanted. So with a new printer, my goal is to improve upon it, make it thinner, make this whole section attainable. As you can see, you can't quite get the whole print area here. Most of it, but not quite. So basically to do this, but do it better. Okay, now that we've seen the original printer, we're going to talk about the new design goals for the Revision 2 of it. So the first goal is for it to be thin. The original one was pretty thin. It was about 7 inches thick, but I think I can do even better. I'm going to shoot for 5 inches thick or less. And the next is to have a full 200 square millimeter print area. It'd be really easy to make a small 3D printer that has a small print area, but I think it'd be more impressive if it's a portable printer and it can also print a large standard area, which would be about 200 square millimeters using uh, that Prusa heated platform. Secondly, autonomous printing. Um, if it's portable, you might not always have a computer with you. So if we could print things right off an SD card, that would be great. Uh, there's already libraries for that, so we should be able to find that pretty easily. Uh, fits an overhead bin. If this thing could actually be compact enough to fit in the overhead bin of an airplane, that would be pretty awesome. So that's gonna be like one of our dream goals. And of course, it has to be super cool. Here, you see a basic drawing idea of what we're gonna do. Here's the end view. So the end view, we want it to be no more than five inches thick this way. And then the side panels will fold out, revealing the main carriage here. So the printing happens in here, and the wide carriage slides in and out. And then in these areas that fold out, we can have some electronics and possibly the power supply. And of course, a convenient carry handle. So I have the original design files from the last printer and very much like the movie Iron Man, I'll keep some of it and throw away the rest. I guess I should, uh, in Iron Man, the first one, he had his suit design when he escaped the cave and he loads that up, but then he throws away like 90% of it except for like the inside and then he starts designing from there. 
That's what I love about that movie. That's so realistic. You take away, you throw away most of it, but there's some of it you keep. The first thing that I designed when I'm making a 3D printer, you know, both times I've done it, is the extruder Y carriage uh, motion. And for this one, I tried to make it as thin as possible. It has the Maker Gear uh, motor with gearbox, like my old printer did, but it has its own custom mount. So one thing I didn't like about the Maker Gear uh, extruder was that it was hard to get at the filament. So in this one, I made my own special clamp. You can still see how it goes into the hot end, and that's a brass tube with a heater on it. But what's a little different about this one is you put the plastic, actually you have to go through this. Put the plastic into this arm, and then you go into the guide hole, and then you go down into the, into the hot end. All right, so the plastic's in place. So I have this arm here, and the arm has the pinch wheel, which is a bearing, and it goes against the plastic. And by making it on a lever, you apply more force down here. So with the spring, if the material uh, width changes or you know, gets thicker or thinner, the spring gives it some uh, push. So no matter what, this is always gonna be pushing the filament directly against the, uh, the gear there. Because if the bearing can't move to vary with the thickness, then you'll lose grip on it. But yeah, this works pretty good. So um, it's quite thin. I think it's just over two inches thick. And here you can see the brass bushings, which our rods will go through on the X carriage, which we will show you now. Here you can see the extruder on the X-axis carriage. Now these are the ends. I lasered them and made them out of these big solid blocks. So I'll show you how it goes back and forth. See if I need some oil. Yeah. So these blocks are, you know, they're pretty, they're already put together in the solid, but if you look inside them, you'll see they have the bushings, which I secured with JB Weld. And then on the inside block, oh, there's also the belt for the motor there. On the inside block, there's a nut, which looks like this. Now I will get a nut. <laughs> So there's one of these metric nuts encased in the intersection here. And what happens is the metric nut goes onto the Z-drive rod like this. And then this rod connects to a stepper motor. So when the motor turns the rod, the nut is fixed on the rod, which causes this carriage to rise up and down. And that's the Z-axis. There's also a limit switch right there. So it's going to, well, you don't actually need a limit switch on a, uh, printer. It's not really that necessary, but on this one, since it's supposed to self-deploy and work without a computer, I thought it'd be important to have these switches so it could home itself and then run files right off the SD card. This is our assembled Y carriage. It has the Y axis, which is up and down on our design. The first thing we wanted to do with it was make it very thin so it would fit inside of our unit. And then it has a lot of very tight tolerances, as you can see. This thing actually goes over the motor and just over the ends, which allows a wider surface to be printed. Same thing in that direction. It has a limit switch, so it can automatically Z itself. You'll hear it click. See that? So that's zero, zero right there. That'll be going to be zero, zero. And it even has engraved markings for the millimeters. So we have about 200 millimeters square that we can print. And I think the height is probably going to be about, I don't know, 100 millimeters. Then we have our belt here. This is a XL style timing belt and then I printed the pulleys. So we have our eight millimeter steel rod for the linear rails, and then have these brass bushings that I got from Chris Craft that it slides on. The bushings aren't quite as smooth as the bearings we used on our first 3D printer last year. However, they take up a lot less space. And then for our connections, we have stepper motor control, limit switch, heat for the bed, and the temperature sensor for the bed. I love 3D printing, and last month at Maker Faire, I realized that many of you do too. So I decided to start a discussion over at element14.com forward slash TBHS, where I'll be sharing some of my favorite 3D printer builds and asking you to show me some of your favorite builds. You'll also be able to register to win the 3D printer we're making here on the show today. Plus, we've added some great bonus content to my Element 14 community page. You can discover how I finally solved my can crushing problem from season one. Watch any episode of The Ben Heck Show on demand. See highlights of my recent tour of the Computer History Museum in Silicon Valley. And of course, post your ideas for future shows. So visit element14.com forward slash TBHS and see how this is just another way that Element 14 brings over 100,000 community members together and makes it easy for engineers to be inspired and find the solutions they need to get the job done. And now, back to the show. Here is our case. It's, in theory, going to fit within 4.2 inches total. So here's our uh, lead screw for the Z-axis. 
Screws are slower than belts, but with the Z-axis going up, it's okay for it to be slow. One, what we do is we look at the threads per inch, or in this case, it's probably threads per centimeter, and every time the rod rotates one revolution, it will raise it by one thread. So let's say you've got thread, 10 threads per inch, it would take 10 rotations to move one inch. So we can use that number to figure out our steps. So here's a little bearing that's at the top. You put that there, and the rod goes down, and it goes into this nice aluminum uh, block we have here, and then it connects to the stepper motor. All right, here are all the axes put together. So let's test them. I actually have a home switch on the Y, so we can, we can test the Y. Okay, it's homed. Let's test the X. Okay, we need to shore up support on the columns. And these aren't actually even bolted in yet, but pretty good. All right, and the Z. Okay, we definitely have to put in the right step values here. Right now, which is running with the default. But uh, it's moving around, so that's good. Nothing's on fire. Well, I'm back from Maker Fair. I got the printer done just in time for Maker Fair, and I got all these sweet stickers for it when I was there. So now I'm gonna show you folks at home how it works. All right, let's open it up. We've got some latches here. So you open up this side first, then this side. So we have our control panel here, which allows us to control it uh, without a computer, although it's usually easier to control the computer. We have a place to put your beer. Okay, so the power supply, when you fold it up, see how it goes into that gap there. So it's all about making sure that everything has its own place. That's why this is in a certain position. This is the park position. It's up a certain ways and then over a certain ways so that when this folds together, it doesn't hit either the driver board or the, um, the print area. So there's a special code which puts this into the right position. So there's some V grooves here. This has a V on it and so does this, so it fits together and slides in. So what you do is this is a big piece that slides over like that to deploy. And then this solid piece of plastic fits into the V grooves on either sides and gives the whole thing its stability. See how it's all connected in one piece now? Here's the bulk of the wiring. In retrospect, I would have done this differently, but oh well. Here's the ramps board. It's the same kind of board we used on the first 3D printer. It has the four stepper motor drivers and underneath it's an Arduino 2580 Mega. Here's the SD card we talked about. Basically, it can use this as a file system and pull uh, G-code files directly off this to run on the machine, so you don't even need a computer. And then all these wires go to power the heaters and of course, drive the stepper motors. All right, I'm gonna run the demo off of the computer, but I'll show you how this panel works anyway. We'll switch it on. Panel turns on, gives us our information. Now, of course, all the software to put on your printer is all open source, so you can find it by searching the internet, but basically this uses the Marlin firmware on the Arduino, and then on Thingiverse, you can find the instructions to build a control panel like this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, prepare it, and I can home the machine using this device right here. So now that it's Z'd in its position, we're ready to print some stuff. We can select a file directly from the card or we can use the computer to do it. Um, in our old printer, we would just manually move the head around and then kind of eyeball it to put it in its home position, but this one's supposed to be portable, portable so it's very important that it can home itself, which it just did. One thing we can do is we can go to the card menu and run some G-code files that are not files to print, but they're useful. So one thing we can do is we can, uh, what do we got here? Z center, we'll put it in the center, kind of, so it's ready to print or heat up, see? And another file that we can run, I'm not gonna run it here though, but uh, is Z fold, and what that does is it puts the head back in its position so it's ready to be folded up. So you can do all these things with the control panel, with no computer attached, although it is easier to use the computer. All right, now that the printer's set up, we can control it using this computer. Um, I prefer to use the program called Pronterface, or also sometimes called Print Run. Um, it just seems to work better for me than Replicator G. But you know, try whatever you want. So Marlin is the firmware you put on this, and Replicator G, or Printerface, or Pronterface, that's the program on your computer that controls this. So I'm going to connect here using Pronterface. Okay, the printer's connected. And now I can Z in uh, Pronterface as well. So I can re-Z it. Again, the card control is a nice gimmicky feature to have, but 
it's much easier to use your computer. So I'm going to set the temperatures. And while that heats up, I can show you some of the Z code commands. You can type commands directly into it. So if I want to go up 20 on the Z, I just type G1, Z20. Okay, once it heats up, we'll be ready to print. All right, the print is done, worked out pretty good. Now we can close the unit up and call it a day. That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we're going to be building some cool projects for outdoor camping purposes. Just in time for summer, we'll see you then. Register to win this build at element14.com forward slash TBHS, where you can join the discussion and suggest other builds for the show. And remember, you can always email build ideas to benheck at element14.com. Thanks for watching.